And away they go. John, John, wait. What are you going for cookies with the kids? What are you doing, man? <laughs> Go on, brother. I'm just giving you a little grief. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate the good That was good, man. Hey, uh, I, I want to give you a text you can use when you, uh, if the Lord prompts you to play, pray this week for Vladimir Putin. Because that can be a mouthful, you know, that we would consider that. But from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3, God's Word says, Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's Putin's issue. The gospel, the good news that we believe of how to properly access a relationship with God is he is blinded to that by our adversary, the devil. That's his problem. Now, what we need to be praying about is the solution. It goes on. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So where did we come about our knowledge of a relationship with God? Because God shown that into our hearts. We need to be praying for an identical experience for Him. Uh, from an eternal perspective, that is His only hope, as it is our only hope. In the meantime, we pray for all those who know him on either side of that conflict, and there are many on either side of that conflict who know him. Many from an aggressive side of things, the Russian side of things, who, who have, are there by force and not by, by choice. We need to be remembering them in prayer. Those who are fleeing for their lives, those who are fighting for their lives, there's just lots to be in prayer about. And um, we need to be careful that we do not just consume the safety and security that we have here. We don't just consume it, but that we are grateful for it and are using it to mobilize ourselves in kingdom activity as opposed to just consuming the blessings that freedom and security brings to us. Okay, that was a sidebar. By the way, speaking of Ukraine, if the Lord has prompted you and you're thinking, man, I wish I could do something, could I give to help? But you don't know where to give. I, I would point you in three directions. Um, Joy Corinne, who plays piano for us, early service and second service, and then they slip on. Um, Joy knows people who are and have been very much involved in the, the adoption circuit and specifically uh, with children from the Ukraine. And so through joy, you could access people who are actually boots on the ground involved in, the, in that environment, if you were interested in doing that. I have a personal relationship with a missionary friend in Florida who has connection and relationship with pastors in the Ukraine. And he has already sent a first round of support uh, to them if you're interested in that. Um, uh, another option that I think probably will resonate with some of you, if nothing else, because of name recognition, you know Billy Graham and his son Franklin Graham, who uh, owns uh, or started and operates Samaritan's Purse. Just heard this week, they have already shipped one of their, I forget, 400 bed hospitals, mobile hospitals already in into the regions where the uh, refugees are fleeing. Maybe it was Poland, I forget where they were going to set it up. But you could go onto their website and give in support of what they're doing. And they have survived many years of uh, the test of integrity, uh, you know, as they have engaged in the world. So any of those are options if the Lord would prompt your heart. You may know of others, you may have already engaged that way. So. Just some things I wanted to point out to you there. 
got the Bible, you know we're working our way through the Gospel of Mark, refreshing ourselves by making much of Jesus. Hard to go wrong making much of Jesus. And so we've just been working through paragraph at a time, and it brings us to Mark 9, verse 30 this morning. It says, From there they went out and began to go through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know about it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. They did not understand the statement. They were afraid to ask him. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. Sitting down, he called the twelve and said to them, If anyone wants to be first, he should be last of all and servant of all. Taking a child, he set him before them, and taking him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me, and whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. Let's pray. Father, yet again, we come before your word, thankful that you have carefully preserved it for us, and that this morning in this place, at this time, thousands of years after this event took place, you have special instruction for our transformation. So help us to humble ourselves before your word, and, and as your Holy Spirit endeavors to teach us, may we listen and, and obey not wishing somebody else was here or hoping somebody else gets it, but that we would hear for ourselves and respond. So we say thanks, Jesus, in advance for what you have for us. In your name we pray. And amen. I wonder this morning how you would define greatness. What is it about someone when you see them and they're impressive in our culture? What is it that what is it that has distinguished them from everybody else? You know, that in our culture, our society, people say, wow, there's something. And so I spent a little time just brainstorming. Power. When someone has a position that they can make changes and be beneficial to others or if they get off the rails with that power and position, sometimes it doesn't look so good as we see in the Ukraine today. Mm -hmm. So power, position, someone who has authority, right? Somebody that has ascended to us, the top of the heap, king of the hill. Yeah. Those are people that, from our perspective, we can look at and say, now there's a great dude. Right? Power. Sometimes possessions. He who dies with the most toys wins, right? So they say, the latest and the greatest, the shiny accumulation of stuff, biggest house, nicest car. You know, the, you, you know, you remember when we were kids, pickups just had one seat. You remember that? Anybody try to buy a pickup with one seat these days? I'm not even sure they're making them anymore. Those things are like cruisers, you know. They just, and they just keep getting bigger in spite of $4 gallon gasoline. They probably, we probably wish we had those little bitty pickups again. <laughs> but possessions, man, that's, that's impressive stuff. That causes people to take notice, right? Linked closely, somebody came up with, a, you know, not only power and position and possessions, but prosperity. And somebody has accumulated a lot of cash. You know, that's impressive. That's, that's the stuff greatness is made of, huh? From our culture's perspective. What else have I got on my list? Ah, pedigree. You ever know anybody that liked a name drop? who they were related to, you know, somebody that had that was well known and, and you like to make sure, they like to make sure that you knew they were related to somebody famous or even if they weren't related to them, that maybe you got, I got their number in my, you know. It's pedigree, who you're related to. You know, we, we, 
used to interact on occasion with a guy who liked to tell us he was related to one of our former governors, one that didn't end up in prison, you know, so that was something to bring up. That's great. That was some greatness there, right? The pedigree. Now, by the time I'm getting down here to five or five, I, I, I'm having to get out my dictionary and hunt for synonyms so I can keep my alliteration going, all right? Some of you English folks will like that. So I had uh, power and position. Somebody added uh, prosperity and possessions and pedigree. And how about prowess? <laughs> you know that stuff you're good at. If you're really good at some stuff, people will think you're something. Why else would we value the opinion of some guy who can take a ball and slam it through a little hoop? Because of his prowess. Man, we put them we put them all over everywhere. They get they get a voice like nobody else because they have prowess at playing ball, huh? Or actors or actresses. You know what they're good at? Pretending like they're somebody they're not. <laughs> and we think, man, they're something. They're wow. You know, put a microphone. They surely got to have something impressive to say about whatever the issue is, right? Because they can do that. They. They have prowess, and we're impressed with prowess. <coughs> Nothing wrong with having some prowess, but it's make you great. Yeah. Now here's one. I'm thinking education. But how do you say that with a P? Well, pedagogy. Mm. That's how you say it. Mm. I had to cheat on that one too. I didn't get that one wrong. <laughs> For instance, I drove by a church sign this week, and it, 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 it said, you could come here and see, you could hear, listen to uh, tomorrow morning, it was yesterday when I saw it, Dr. Reverend so-and-so. Whoa, there's a dude's got some education. He's into some pedagogy. You know, wow. You, you get enough education, you get a whole alphabet behind your name, and that's surely impressive, right? You've got to know something. Hmm? Now, I like education, but... great. <clears throat> and the last one I came up with was performance. What have you done? You know? What have you accomplished in the past that caused people to ooh and ah and say, wow, you, you, you're something because of, look, I know what you've done. You know, sort of the past laurels kind of thing. Anything else come to mind? Any, anything else come to mind that our culture looks at and says, wow, that, you, you, you're impressive. That's, wow. Anything else? Maybe persistence, staying at something for a long time. Okay, long persistence, yeah. It means you just outlived everybody else that was doing it, too, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a P. I like that. But did you notice that Jesus had a different opinion? <clears throat> about what makes you great. And yet again, we run into this concept that Jesus and the values of his kingdom don't necessarily line up with that which is pressed upon us by our culture. Let's look at the text again. So they're traveling again, but Jesus doesn't want to know that they're in this area of Galilee. Granted, because... We're just months away from the crucifixion and, and the opposition is intensifying. Just in a few months, they're going to nail him to a cross. It's getting serious. So he's staying under the radar a little bit. And he brings up this issue. They've already identified that he is the Christ. At least the guys have made that declaration. You remember not long ago, we saw that in the scripture. But he keeps talking about he's going to be delivered into the hands of men and killed. And then something about rising three days later. And we've already seen that just didn't fit their definition of Messiah. Messiah was going to be fail-safe. He was going to bring political glory back to Israel. I mean, we're going to be the big guys on the block again when Messiah comes. We've been hoping for him for hundreds of years. What do you mean, Messiah? That you're going to be taken custody of and they're going to kill you? And this rape, raising thing, well, what, what is that about? And they don't even want to ask him about it. They, they didn't understand it and were afraid to ask. 
Well, yeah, the last time Peter thought he understood, remember what happened? Jesus got right in his face. <laughs> said, get behind me, Satan. Well, nobody wants to go there, so they're just going to let that go. Just let him keep talking about it. We don't know what he's talking about. You ever feel like that? And so they get to Capernaum. They kind of travel along in silence. It's an uneasy silence, no doubt. Because Jesus is talking about this stuff. They're not comfortable talking about that stuff. And as they're traveling along, in the midst of the silence, they come up with something to talk about, and they leave Jesus out, kind of talking under their breath. Or they let him get a little ways ahead, and they lag behind. We don't know for sure how it happened. But Jesus says, hey, guys, what were you talking about as we were traveling there? On the way, what was, what was the topic? And they didn't want to tell him. And they didn't want to talk about that with him. Why? Because the discussion was all about which one of them was going to be the greatest. They're back there as they're traveling along, trying to establish the pecking order. Peter, James, John, who's going to be the big man on the block? Who's going to be the recognized leader? Who's going to be revered among the group? Who's going to get the major billing, the, the place on the marquee? Who, who, uh, what? That's what they're talking about with each other. They didn't want to talk about it. The trouble is, Jesus already knows, right? So he takes this as a teachable moment. After they've been quibbling with each other, jockeying for position, trying to chop each other off at the knees to recommend themselves for the primo spot in the group, Jesus says, hey, fellas, here's how it works. Here's how it works with me. If anyone wants to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Well, now that doesn't sound like that list I read, rattled off a little bit ago, does it? They wanted to be great. They were thinking about positions and power and possessions and all the P list we had. And Jesus says, not in my kingdom. Matter of fact, say so you want to be first? Into the line and serve at the tire. That's how you get to be first. Now I used to read that wrong. I used to read that as if you had leadership aspirations. Then you were going to get it. If you had this desire to lead, what's going to happen to you is you're going to get sent to the end of the line and you're going to be everybody's servant instead. You're just full of yourself. But I don't think that's what he was saying at all. Do you want to know the avenue, the route that you need to travel in order to be considered first in the kingdom? But you will have a heart willing to serve any and all who need it. But it won't bother you to stand at the end of the line. That won't be a problem for you. You won't, you won't be driven by um, the affirmation of your peers. That's not, who, that's not what's going to matter to you. All the stuff that our culture says is what it takes to be great. That's not the, You won't even care about the fanfare. The band playing for you, it won't matter, right? <laughs> Rather, if you want to be first, you'll have a heart that says, you first. And then he gives them an object lesson. He takes a child and sets that little fellow before them and then takes that little guy in his arms, probably just gets him right up in his lap, and he says, whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. And whoever receives me does not receive me, but him who sent me. And you see, the thing about a child is that in their culture especially, and to some degree ours today, is they can be easy to overlook, can't they? 
In that culture, a child, the, the payoff for raising kids didn't come until years later. But if you had sons, those kids would take care of their dad when they got when dad got old. So the real gold mine was in having a bunch of sons. Now, if you had daughters, you could kind of farm them out for a bride's price, but that was the end of it. Those sons, they'd keep on giving. Sorry, ladies, that's just kind of how it worked back in that day. But you didn't look at a kid in that day and say, wow, because it was delayed gratification on those kids. It didn't come till much later. So they were easy to overlook. They were often undervalued. You didn't really think about that so much back in that day. But Jesus says, if you receive one child, it's just like you're receiving me, he said. And not just me, but my father too. It's just counter to our day. <coughs> we want to lead with what's in this for me? What am I going to get out of it? As opposed to let me defer to another, especially one, especially one that there's no, there's no immediate payback here. There's no quid pro quo, as we've learned the Latin phrase recently. You know, you're not going to get anything out of helping a kid. You may not even get a thank you. How many times has that happened to you? Do something special for a kid and the kid doesn't even just go, right? Jesus says, that's what it looks like to serve others. Now, we've got to work on that word, receives. Whoever receives one child like this in my name receives me. To, to put some imagery to that word, it is as if you extend a helping hand. To extend assistance to someone. That's what it is. You know when your little ones are first learning to walk? And they want to, and they're trying to, but you remember, remember you're right there with hands just ready to reach in and intervene and help. You remember? And, and if the circumstances are called for it, you'll get right a hold of them by the hand, yes? Because you're going to take care of them. We, we have some concrete steps at our house, and when our grandkids... They want to go down them, and when they first start trying, it's no option. You grab a hold of that kid, right? And then there'll come a day when, like, our four-year-old granddaughter refuses any assistance on the stairs. You know, doesn't matter if there's snow or ice or anything. No, I don't need any help. Well, you're either going to let me help, or I'm carrying you down these stairs. It's not optional here, you know? Right? To extend a hand to one who may know they need it or maybe resents it, but you extend the support and assistance to someone. Someone that is often overlooked, is undervalued, someone who likely doesn't even have the means to reciprocate your assistance. Jesus says, that's what servanthood looks like in my kingdom. <coughs> that's when you'll know you're doing the deal. When you're leading in my kingdom. When you find somebody like that. It's not all, we're not talking, don't get in your mind like you've got to run out and start doing stuff with a bunch of kids. Although kids are great and, and Jeffrey here, man, he's, he, they are serving children. And that's phenomenal. But there are a lot of people that you come in contact with that have got way more years than that, but they need a hand. And they're overlooked, and they're undervalued, and they probably can't reciprocate your kindness or whatever it is that you might do for them. But you do it anyway, and you do it in Jesus' name. You do it as, as because you're representing Him. Jim Morgan, you still travel for work? Yes, sir. You go all over the world at times. And when you arrive, you represent who? Precision. You probably got on even the little stuff, right? They give you gear so everybody knows. They can spot him a mile away. Hey, there's the man, you know. He's come in the name of precision. The company works for. 
he also, when he shows up, is going in Jesus' name because he is a Christ follower. When we do these kind of hand ups, we do it in Jesus' name, representing him as if he were doing it through us to people that are often overlooked and often not very grateful or appreciative and generally speaking won't ever be able to throw a bone back at you. <laughs> it just it's probably won't happen. But that's okay. Because Jesus says, you know what, when you reach that hand out to somebody like that, it's just like you're doing it for me. And for us, that's plenty. To give Jesus a hand up, to give his Father a hand up. You want a definition of greatness? That's what it looks like mm -hmm. from a kingdom perspective. Now, the world's not going to opt in. The world's not buying that line. You know, power and position and possessions and prosperity and pedagogy, and I forget the rest of the list. Yeah, that, 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 that turns their heads. God says, no. The greatest will be at the end of the line in serving others. That's how you recognize who's first in my kingdom. Jesus summed it up this way, a summary verse in Matthew 20, 28. For not even the Son of Man came to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's greatness in the kingdom. Serving to the point of personal sacrifice. Matthew 20, 28. It's not a bad life verse. It's guided me a long time. Got a song that will give will give you some words. A prayer, if you will. But be careful singing it. Or you're welcome to sing along with Maranoff. It's an old song. But don't just sing it for the sake of singing it. Sing, sing it as a as a prayer in response to the instruction of our Lord this morning. He says, make me a servant. And then I'll come back and close. Hey, I'll give you a little, uh, little test you can use to get a feel for how you're doing on your servanthood. You get good insight into how you're doing on your servanthood by how, how you react the next time somebody treats you like one. You'll figure out pretty, pretty quick your response when somebody treats you like a slave. You get pretty pussy, right? <laughs> well, then we still got some work to do. <laughs> Humility is a key component of what we've talked about this morning. Let me just direct you in closing to Isaiah 66. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where then is a house you could build for me and where is a place that I may rest? For my hand made all these things. Thus all these things came into being, declares the Lord. He's a pretty impressive guy. He says, the best you got is where I prop my feet and you're going to build me a house? You know? He said, I made all this stuff. But then... To this one I will look. In other words, this, this is the person that gets my attention. Amen. To him who is humble and contrite of spirit. That, those are character qualities to be humble. And contract that's broken. Aware of our need, aware of our status before him. Here's the one that catches my attention. The one who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. You know, we're, God, what do you want me to do? That's what we fixate on. God, how, how? Start by trembling at his word. 
And that doing stuff will take care of itself. You don't have to worry about that. Respect and revere his word and let it transform your character. Kingdom greatness is upon you at that point. Amen. Amen. Brother, what time? A week from Saturday, what time does the work day begin? I know these guys. There are some there are some beefy workers in here with some prowess to bring. <laughs> so I will be uh, rattling some cages and we not just guys, there's some gals. Uh, ladies didn't need to leave. You're worth more than a bride price, all right? So didn't need to finish it. So yeah, we'll stay. So time? Okay, so we'll start around nine o'clock. And, uh, let's see, what is the drive hour and from here? 15, 30 minute hour, 15 or 30 minutes? Okay, sign still out on the road headed south. I used to know the mileage, but it's been a while. Yeah, okay. Hey, you get, God has young people on your heart. Get with Jeff before you get out of here and just and let him know you're cheering him on and with how God may be prompting you to engage in your ball. All right, God bless you. Let's go be the church. Have a great week.